maybe just to let people know, Heather, that when we get to the Q&A, we'll stop recording. Yes, so um, we, we can have much more of an informal session then. So welcome. Um, I'd, I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging that we meet on the lands of Aboriginal peoples all over Australia. Um, I don't know how far widespread all of you are, but I'm based here in Adelaide on the land of the Ghana people. And um, we acknowledge their, their sovereignty uh, and that sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, we are going to uh, encourage you to write your questions into the chat box as we go along. Uh, so please uh, type away. I've also set up a bit of a Google Doc um, and if we end up having to close off the session, we will try and get everything answered eventually with links and, and places you can go for information. Uh, so that will get us um, sorted there. So let's kick off. What is community energy? Uh, the Coalition for Community Energy has been going since uh, 2014. Let me... Can you, you can all see the right screen there, can't you? Yep, great. So um, uh, we have run two congresses in 2014. The Congress was really about bringing uh, the sector together, uh, a nascent sector, a few initiatives um, here and there. And uh, of course, Hepburn Wind was one of the pioneers in the sector. So they'd been around for a lot longer than 2014. But um, that was the start of uh, the Coalition for Community Energy. In 2017, our Congress was much more about, wow, we've got 100 groups around Australia, um, but so many of them haven't got their first project started yet. So we had a Congress around learn from the people who have got started, who have managed to build projects, learn about what they're doing and how they're doing it, and um, take away the tools and resources uh, that can help you get started and your group. Um, since then, and this year we were due to have another Congress, but we've instead launched our Knowledge Hub, um, given that COVID-19 has slowed us down a bit, and that we hope builds on the old wiki that um, Embark and Hepburn Wind had started for us uh, way back in 2014, but it, um, it allows much more of a everybody can contribute uh, style thing. And we hope over time that will become a real knowledge resource for us all. Uh, when you meet people from the community energy sector, they are very willing to share. So there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears in, in the things that um, we have uh, learnt and we wouldn't want everybody to go through exactly the same learning curve. We want to speed everyone up. So there's an awful lot of resources out in the sector, in the brains of lots of people and part of having the coalition is bringing us all together to um, be able to find each other. We will be running some e-congresses um, instead of our Congress this year and next year. And we're just planning those initiatives as we speak. So this is what the community energy sector looks like. Over a hundred groups in um, all parts of Australia, especially concentrated in the estates where they've had a lot of support. So New South Wales and Victoria have had government support and that has helped those groups to flourish, and a similar number of projects all around Australia as well. And there's a lot of reasons why we're exploring um, community energy. Um, many of you would have um, come through the Fight for Planet A uh, link. Uh, we've had a lot of inquiries since the energy segment on the ABC television show, because they showcased Hepburn Wind, and it, Everyone got excited. How do we do this? And the reason community energy appeals is because it is about different ways of doing things. And I'm quite fond of describing the sector as a sort of 
innovation edge where all of us are out exploring different things and exploring different ways that we could make um, energy work. You know, we, we obviously live with a model that's um, globally managed by big oil corporations and, and even the, um, the main electricity businesses in Australia are, are very uh, are linked to international businesses. And here comes renewable energy that's available to everyone as a resource. So in terms of community energy and what it can do in these times, it can obviously act as a real stimulus for rethinking how we do um, things locally. Uh, we've had the bushfires and COVID-19 this year. Um, a lot of people in the community energy sector are very keen on changing the equity arrangements. How do we make sure everybody comes into a renewable future with us, not just um, the people who can afford solar panels, for example. And we believe that in many cases, doing energy locally can make places more resilient as well. It can build social capital. So there's a lot of things uh, there. And um, I like talking about uh, the distributed energy model. A lot of people, this is, this is the topic of my PhD, so I can get a little bit carried away. But um, a lot of people in the energy sector talk about the internet of energy, how we're going from an old centralised model to a network of small and local. And really, there's a, there's a couple of tensions in the sector where where the the corporates are dragging us is different to where uh, to where we would take ourselves if we work together as communities. So um, that's one of the reasons my that slides in there. Oops, um, let me advance that. So it sort of throws up this whole question, right? You know, we know the corporates know how to do centralised um, energy, and as as solar particularly has dropped in price. You've seen those companies rush out and do massive solar systems. We've also seen them talk about virtual power plants and open energy networks, but that's the energy corporates thinking about all of us as individual customers. And yet a lot of the value that we produce is local. It's, it's how um, we're in between ourselves and, and um, the big power stations, we could produce a lot of self-sufficiency at the neighbourhood level. It might be the street transformer level, 100 houses, and it might be the feeder level, which is sort of 3,000 houses, a whole suburb. That's where um, our new energy system could go. So I'm gonna, that's a sort of intro, and it's as much about the energy transition as it is about community energy. I'm gonna hand over to Taryn to take us through all the different models we've seen emerge in the community energy sector. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Heather, and thanks everyone. And um, yeah, I, I'm sorry if you if you're very familiar with a lot of this content because you you kind of know what's going on in the space. But um, our understanding was that a uh, who's here tonight is is really a lot of a lot of new people who are just really keen to find out um, what's going on. So so that's very much um, what we've put together. So I've got a bit of an overview of models um, and, you know, obviously they range in complexity and, you know, some of them are just kind of no brainers that any community just should be getting on with and, and doing. So if, if you are keen in your community, um, you know, there's some very easy wins um, within this list. So the first and the most notable easy win is bulk buy models. Um, so look, these have been around for, you know, probably about 15 years in regards to, to bulk buy of, of solar PV. So really making it more accessible, uh, bulk procurement, you know, going through a kind of trusted process with a tender and, you know, really engaging your community to get as many as possible up and, and taking up an offer. Um, so there's lots of kind of aggregates who, who offer um, bulk buys in different states. So they're kind of like support agencies that can deliver them in partnership with either a community energy group and or local councils. 
Um, frequently local, local councils are, are really happy to give support for this. Um, and it's also something that can really, uh, you know, enable local installers, um, you know, to have, have more local work. So often that frequently there'll be kind of conditions within a bog fire arrangement that you, you're meant to sort of support local installers. Um, some of the, I guess, the, the new wave of bulk buys is, um, you know, how it's applied to the rental market. This is particularly in Victoria because there is, you know, subsidies available under Solar Victoria for, for um, rental homes at the moment. There's shared ownership arrangements. Um, there's bulk buys around electric vehicles and charging infrastructure happening, um, heat pumps as well. So it's really kind of taking that model of bulk procurement and making it just more accessible and around more things. Um, it's also happening a lot with uh, just energy efficiency upgrades. So, um, you know, things like draft proofing and stuff like that, which um, isn't very sexy, but, you know, it really makes a difference in homes. I'll get you to move on to the next one. So this is the donation model um, uh, approach. And again, this is, you know, a really, um, I guess, easy win for, for any community, particularly communities that are starting and that might wanna get a few runs on the board, um, working with a support agency uh, to deliver this or replicating a model from another community is a, is a really good way to do it. So these can be flat donation models where it's, um, you know, maybe it's your local council or, it's um, you know coming from a philanthropic group and it's a pure donation um, just to get solar on the rooftops uh, or a grant you know of some kind and, and through to a variation which is um, you know the Karenna model which is a revolving fund so zero interest loans or, or very cheap finance that are supporting community buildings to get solar on their rooftop and as they acquire savings and their bills they're able to pay back that that installation price and then that money flows on to another group the next slide so and then i guess incrementally in complexity um this is the most popular model in australia at the moment and it's de been deployed um over 50 times already in australia and it's uh solar arrays that are around about you know under 100 kilowatts so so generally they might be anywhere from kind of 30 to 100 kilowatts uh, and they're typically on commercial enterprises and the, the the solar generation is being sold directly to that commercial enterprise and then the the profits from that is going back into community investors and also to pay back you know pay back the investors so the models uh, the governance structures that are typically being deployed are trusts um, that's in the case of, of clear sky uh, cooperatives which is in the case of pingala uh, and then uh, company structure so special purpose vehicle structures which is in the case of, of repower shellhaven um, and, and typically what's happening is these groups are, are setting up and doing one project and then they're just replicating. And the really nice thing about it is that, you know, it, 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 you can do this anywhere. It can absolutely happen in most urban centres as well as in most regional centres. So it's one of those models that's really um, not, you know, not about it just working in a regional area um, like some of the, the larger pro pro projects do. So this is really... Um, yeah, can be can be done anywhere. The next one. So then we go into the sort of mid scale community energy models. And what I mean by mid scale is the one to 10 megawatts. So this might be, uh, you know, scaled for a, a town, a local town or a village. Um, and generally, we're seeing the models be either cooperatives or companies. So the examples of that are, so Hepburn Wind um, is the cooperative of 2013 members. The Haystack Solar Garden is just being established at the moment and that is also a cooperative structure and they will be using, uh, they'll be working with Pingala in their back end. And then there's company structures. So both Denmark Community Wind Farm and SolarShare are both company structures. And we're also starting to see some innovative retailing occurring. Um, so Haystacks is the first solar garden model. So that will be um, basically the structure is that investors uh, take their return as a credit of their electricity bill. So it's kind of making direct that, that electricity um, saving component. Whereas the other, the other projects are more typical in regards to um, making returns. That's okay, I'll, I'll jump into the next one. Um, and then all the way up to 
uh, I guess the large scale commercial projects. Um, so last year we saw the first community co-investment model. And again, this, this is a very easy model to participate in. It just takes a, you know, a willing developer and a willing community to um, unlock models like this. So in communities where you're seeing um, large scale developments, this uh, model has finally been busted, um, you know, and made, made possible um, for many years. Uh, lots of people were working in the space trying to get it unlocked. So it was really exciting when Sapphire Wind Farm went ahead and did it. Um, so Sapphire Wind Farm is a very large scale project up in New England. It's 270 megawatts. Uh, and essentially they opened up for community investment. So it's a portion of community investment and it's purely a financial exchange. So there is no kind of seat at the table in regards to governance. There's no asset management obligation of the community investment vehicle. And how they were able to establish that was through using Domacom, which is a fractional investment platform. Um, so there's no kind of, I guess, obligation on the community to manage a structure ongoingly. It's, it's purely um, an investment, like a, a sort of um, crowdfunding investment scenario. Uh, the second project that will be a community investment project in Australia will be a 50 uh, megawatt hour battery in Canberra. So this is a NEON project and it's part of the ACT's uh, mandate for, um, uh, you know, surpassing 100% renewable because they've already already met their target, but they're, they're sort of filling in other bits like transport now. Um, so yeah, so that, that was just announced last week. So there will be um, another community investment opportunity and hope, you know, we hope to see more and more commercial projects um, at least offer this uh, as an option to their local communities um, for those that are interested to take it up. And then another exciting way that we're seeing all over Australia is um, uh, the approach of whole of community planning. And so typically how this is being demonstrated is through communities setting targets and goals or having an ambition and then working out a plan how to get there. So this might be a roadmap or a master plan. Um, and generally the three targets that are most commonly being looked at, and I guess they're a bit of a transition of each other. So the first is the 100% renewable target. So this is very focused on electricity in the home. Uh, and it can, and it's also, um, you know, can relate to to getting off gas. So, you know, heat and electricity within the home, uh, and so totally renewable yak and dander is uh, uh, doing a great job um, up in in northern Victoria, and they are supporting a lot of communities and activating a lot of communities in their patch to to also have a hundred percent renewable mandate, and how they're facilitating that transition is largely through mini grids. Um, so they don't have any kind of larger projects, but they're doing a lot of mini grids and also community scale batteries and um, lots of rooftop solar. And then there's the zero net energy target. So zero net energy um, refers to uh, that piece that is 100% renewable. So it's, you know, heat and electricity, but it also um, uh, refers to transport and offsetting transport into the future. And then there's zero net emissions and zero net emissions uh, refers to all of those pieces and then adds on top uh, industry, agriculture, waste and those additional elements um, into the piece. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of the beyond zero emissions communities are, are quite common uh, around Australia and they're um, generally working on those those zero net emissions targets. Um, ZNet and Hepburnshire in my community is a zero net emissions master plan um, for 10 years that we're working towards. So yes, so that's, that's also a very kind of common movement and typically what you'll see within those movements is, is multiple community energy projects or programs, um, you know, energy efficiency programs, bulk buys, all of those things, I guess, converging under one uh, master plan. And then the other exciting trend uh, that's happening is around community energy retailing. So the two kind of models that we have in Australia at the moment is uh, the ANOVA model, which is up in New South Wales. So, so formed up near Byron Bay and, and I guess, you know, growing every year. And they are a community owned and operated model. So it, it was community investors um, that started it and they have taken, you know, all of the regulatory responsibility and um, hold all of the retail licenses. 
and um, yeah, are, are able to service their, their community um, through that model. And then the second common model is what's called white labeling. And essentially it's about um, uh, having a brand of community, being a community energy retailer, but using a back end service for that regulatory piece. So Indigo Power, which is up um, where the guys at, at Totally Renewable Yak and Danda are, um, that kind of region, they're, they're utilising them, that model at the moment. I just wanted to touch a little bit on um, advocacy because we do, I guess one of our other roles um, at the Coalition for Community Energy, aside from uh, you know, what we do around the Congress and the Knowledge Hub is really trying to have a united front around advocacy. Uh, a lot of that is focused on state level um, because it, it can be very challenging at a federal level to get any sort of movement. Um, and some of the, the pushes that we've been making, both, both at a state and a federal level, um, we have, you know, lately had quite a lot of support from Helen Haynes, um, who was an independent MP on the federal level um, in Victoria and New South Wales. There is, um, you know, very good support at the moment for community energy projects and programs and Queensland recently announced some funding. Um, so there is, there is movement. Uh, and so what, what we're now pushing for is a community energy target. So this um, would either be at a federal level or at a state by state level. So for example, in the case of Victoria, there is a Victorian renewable energy target. What we're asking for is a carve out of that renewable energy target with a portion of it set aside for community energy. Um, so yeah, having a dedicated target and then having a mechanism to support that target to be realised. Um, so a feed-in tariff is the most commonly deployed um, method of, of how this can be achieved um, in, internationally. It's, it's been very well proven uh, and it's also a model that we understand. We understand that how solar on a rooftop generates a feed-in tariff. So applying that model um, to community energy projects is what we've been requesting. We've also been doing some lobbying around um, what we call the Smart Energy Communities Program, and that is to support more community power hubs. So in Victoria, we've had a pilot of three community power hubs in the regions, and we wanna see that expanded around Australia. Um, also support for zero net emissions community planning uh, and ongoing kind of support for these communities, uh, for baseline support and a capacity building network. And then the last item there is the Solar for All program. And this is really about um, ensuring that, that social justice piece and making sure that, um, you know, everyone, whether they're renters or low income users can also access rebates uh, and, and projects um, for solar. So models like solar gardens fit into that. And it's back to me. So um, I would like, before we get to the questions and answers, to encourage you all to have a look at the Knowledge Hub. Um, we've uh, organised all the material from our previous wiki in terms of articles, um, guides, tools and templates and case studies, plus all the webinars. So over the last three years, we've had a, a number of webinar series where we've showcased different um, ways of doing different particular projects and ways of doing community energy. And um, we've also showcased uh, some of the material that comes through in the guides uh, doing community scale solar is a Victorian guide, I think. Taryn, you were involved in that. And um, the Clean Energy Council also has a guide. Um, Taryn, I feel like I'm talking out of school because you, you've been an author on both of those. Um, so that's the, the um, website address for um, the Knowledge Hub. Um, and I, all I can do is encourage you to, to give it a go, right? It's like a wiki. It, it's meant to sit between your static websites and your very dynamic social media feeds where you can never find that interesting thing you saw last week um, by enabling you to have much more uh, control over content but also interact socially uh, and and have chats within the website so the way to get started is to join the hub 
or sign up, log in. And once you do, you can see all the groups, all the topics and all the members. Now, when you write stuff or produce stuff on the site, you can choose whether it's public or um, just open to people who are logged in. So what you see before you log in is all the public stuff, but once um, you actually get logged in, you'll be able to see more of the, um, what the groups are up to. So um, we're going to move to uh, a Q&A now. Uh, we've got a good half an hour. I'm, um, I'm gonna actually stop the recording and I'm going to um, take off the slide so we can all see each other. Uh, I'd love it if you could write in the chat box um, to, to let me just